Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rahul Gosain. And I am Rohit Gosain. And we are Oncology Brothers. Today, we have the pleasure to have Dr. Erica Hamilton, a leading breast oncologist, who is also the director of the Breast and Gynecological Cancer Research Program at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute. Dr. Hamilton will walk us through her approach to treating her two new positive breast cancer using an algorithm. Let us welcome Dr. Hamilton. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. Excited. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Hamilton. Our focus with this algorithm approach is so we can continue to reiterate the current standard of care practices in our community settings. Along with that, we'll follow up with two cases from the community itself. Here's the algorithm. So in this algorithm that you guys have put together, I think it looks great. Um, you know, early stage, which are smaller tumors, no negative. Um, we know from uh, the APT study that we can do Taxol along with Trastuzumab uh, itself, so TH regimen um, with less side effects for patients. A lot of times patients um, can even escape without losing their hair. Really um, up to the individual of whether they want to do surgery up front or um, chemotherapy up front, typically for less than one centimeter cancers, we typically just do surgery up front and in some cases up to two centimeters as well. Um, certainly, you know, consider radiation, um, whether the patient has had a lumpectomy or mastectomy and no negative, a lot of times you can't escape radiation and continue your trastuzumab. The second orange heading you have here are locally advanced, so bigger tumors or node positive tumors. And this is the setting in which we've seen a benefit for pertuzumab, so TCHP, really indicated for either two centimeters or node positive. And we typically do this in a neoadjuvant fashion for a couple of reasons. One, they tend to have bigger tumors and node positive, and we don't want anyone kind of metastasizing while we're waiting for surgery and healing from surgery, et cetera. So we really like to kind of get on board quick and shrink the tumor um, and then go to surgery. And maybe an even bigger reason is we're, we're then allowed to kind of risk stratify our individual patient. So we're giving them good chemotherapy, two chemotherapies with two HER2 agents. And if they have a pathologic complete response at the time of surgery, we're able to continue the HP. And if they don't, then those are the patients we're more worried about and where we've seen the benefit for TDM1 from Catherine. There is one regimen kind of in between these two, in between TH and TCHP, which is TCH. And I still do use that sometimes. I tend to use it um, for patients that are maybe a little bit younger, uh, have tumors over a centimeter, don't quite meet that two centimeters for TCHP. And then on the bottom, we have advanced and metastatic disease. Still um, in 2022, our standard is taxane with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, and then going on to maintenance. I think an important thing to remember in this setting is that for our patients that are ER positive, when we drop out the chemo, we often add the endocrine therapy. So that's perfectly fine to do. And then in the second line setting, we've certainly seen a lot of data about trastuzumab drugs to can recently. I think for most of us that that's probably our treatment of choice in the second line setting. And the one caveat of where I might use Cape Cytobine, Trastuzumab, and Tocatinib would probably be in the setting of brain metastases. As you've outlined here, I think third line and beyond, it becomes a lot more confusing. Um, we certainly still have TDM1. We have chemo uh, with margituximab. We have Cape Cytobine with Meratinib or Lugpatinib. Um, or even to catnib and cape cytobine if you've used uh, the trastuzumab druxtecan in the second line. Um, so it becomes a little bit more confusing there. And I don't think we fully kind of figuring out sequencing. Um, some people say, well, if I was giving trastuzumab druxtecan, I probably wouldn't go straight to another ADC. I probably wouldn't give TDM1. I'd give something else in the middle. And probably might be a right answer, but one of the things that's really going to influence our decision there is whether what the mechanism of resistance to trastuzumab druxtecan is. If you can imagine if it's down regulation of actual HER2 expression, then TDM1 is probably not the best choice. Probably chemotherapy with a trastuzumab or a cape cytobine with a jacatinib would be a better choice. But we really haven't quite figured all of that out. If it's resistance to the payload, uh, then other ADCs with a different payload may make sense. So certainly a quickly evolving field with a lot of moving targets. Dr. Hamilton, actually going back uh, to locally advanced for a second, um, if a patient has achieved PCR with TCHP, how much is the dual anti-HER2 therapy 
adding towards better survival over just, let's say, single agent trastuzumab? Yeah, that's a great question and one that we don't have an answer to as part of the trials. You know, traditionally, we've been thinking that patients that are high enough risk to warrant the TCHP up front, um, you know, we would continue that HP for to finish out the year of maintenance. Um, you know, I mean, I think it depends on the patient's individual characteristics. To me, it also depends a lot about their tolerance. I find that patients tolerate HP alone much better than they do TCHP. And so a lot of times when you drop that chemo out, really the diarrhea all but goes away. Um, but we don't have a great randomized trial to help us figure out who really continues to need the pertuzumab. Thank you so much for going over the algorithm, Dr. Hamilton. Let's dive into our first case from the community. It's a 63-year-old postmenopausal female who self-palpated the right breast lump, which was later confirmed on mammogram and ultrasound to be measuring about two centimeter. MRI breast did reveal an extra five millimeter right axillary lymphadenopathy, with, which on MRI guided biopsy was in fact negative for malignancy, but did reveal uh, high grade cells. The biopsy for the primary tumor did show invasive ductal carcinoma, HER2 positive, negative for ERPR. There was a debate about TCHP versus TH, um, but the patient did uh, agree on uh, TCHP. And post-completion of the therapy, there was no residual disease on lumpectomy and sentinel lymph node biopsy was negative. Post-adjuvant radiation, she has been doing well on HP. Now, looking at this case, would you have handled the case in a different fashion or you would have gone about the same way? Along with that, what is your cutoff for utilizing TCHP versus TH um, for this patient or other patients? Yeah, I mean, traditionally, I do use the two centimeters um, or certainly anybody that's node positive is the cutoff. I think that becomes a little bit trickier when you get into patients that are a little bit older. I mean, I think TCHP is more tough to tolerate than TCH by itself. Really kind of the chemo with the pertuzumab really seems to magnify diarrhea. Um, I think for this patient, you know, it ended up that the axillary lymph node, you know, wasn't involved, but um, you know, I do agree with this. I think you can always start TCHP. If somebody's not tolerating it well, you can kind of scale back to TCH. Um, but, but I agree for this woman with two centimeters of cancer, at least, I probably would have done the exact same thing. Thank you. And then Dr. Hamilton, in what settings are you even entertaining the idea of neratinib in adjuvant settings? Yeah, so I think that's a really tough question right now. Um, so, you know, our magnitude of benefit was really bigger with TDM1 than it was with neratinib. So for patients with residual disease, I'm really thinking about TDM1 as my first go-to. Now, the question is, is, is there anybody that is appropriate for neratinib? I mean, we certainly could put it after. One important caveat is that the patients that benefited from neratinib one, all had residual disease. So this patient is too low risk, right? She's had a great response, doesn't need it. But the patients that benefited from neratinib were the patients that had ERPR positive disease. And we're not exactly sure. We think it's somehow um, involved with, you know, crosstalk of um, signaling between, uh, you know, HER2 and some of the other receptors with the estrogen receptor, et cetera. But it really looks like that's the patient population that has benefit. So for another reason, I wouldn't be thinking about neratinib in this patient. And for residual disease, if there is in fact just one to two millimeters left, are you still relying on TDM1 or would you consider HP in that setting? Yeah, I think that's a tough question. Um, that kind of gets into me about the age of the patient. How good was the response compared to how much tumor they initially had? How well did they tolerate therapy? Um, I, you know, for residual disease really in Catherine, any amount of residual disease uh, went. You know, there is um, a trial out there um, right now kind of looking at less TDM1. You know, so we did TDM1 kind of, you know, for a year. And really, by the end of that year, it was tough for a little bit of patients to tolerate. And so you could always think about a reduced duration of the TDM1 as well there, but not a not a question that we've got great and great uh, scientific answer to at this point. Thank you. Thank you for that. We can now dive into our second case from the community. Here we have a 57-year-old postmenopausal woman with a new onset of right hip pain. Her workup is consistent with multiple lytic bone lesions and a left breast mass. The breast mass is consistent with poorly differentiated ER-negative, PR-negative, HER2-new-positive invasive ductal carcinoma. 
Her brain MRI also revealed two to three small brain lesions with very minimal vasogenic edema, though she's essentially asymptomatic with her brain lesions. What would be your approach in managing such patients? Yeah, this is tough. You know, uh, unfortunately, I think we're seeing more of these patients right now that present with de novo disease, um, probably due to COVID, due to some people missing their screening mammograms, due to, due to people having so much stress in their lives, they really just kind of put their health on the back burner, even if they noticed a breast mass. So it really is unfortunate. Um, you know, the thing that stands out uh, about this case is that this woman's really pretty young, you know, late 50s, and um, the brain disease. So I would definitely kind of take care of the brain disease with radiation. Um, you know, typically we would do radiation, stereotactic radiosurgery if there's just kind of three um, lesions. But I would, I would take care of that locally, and then I probably would continue to follow the algorithm with THP. This is the type of patient, depending on how her brain disease is doing, that I may consider using capecitabine trastuzumab to catnib in the second lining instead of trastuzumab deruxtecan, particularly if the brain disease is still active. Um, so two questions. Going back to the bone disease and workup, how often do you chase the bone biopsy um, in these patients and what's the true utility of that? And then the role of bone mo uh, modifying agents in these patients. Yeah, so absolutely. Let's answer the second question first. That one's easier. I definitely uh, try to get all patients that have bone metastases on bone modifying agents. Um, I really think that that's beneficial for them. We get into less trouble with calcium. We get into less trouble with fracture. Sometimes I think that it even helps with pain a little bit just to really kind of strengthen and shore up that area. In terms of the biopsy, I try not to biopsy bone because, you know, as you know, uh, it's calcified. We don't get as good a quality of tissue through the fixation process. Sometimes our receptors are a little bit less reliable. But for this patient, if she only has brain and bone, and if they're not going to resect these lesions because they think they can do radiation, I definitely would biopsy, maybe not because I'm counting on a lot of information for it or good enough tissue to do profiling, but just to prove that this truly is metastatic breast cancer. I think we've all been burned before thinking that somebody has a uh, metastatic breast cancer and it turns out it's myeloma or it's a second cancer or something like that. So definitely want to at least make sure you know what you're treating in terms of metastatic disease. Absolutely. With the recent data for TDXD, how do you sequence that in comparison with trastuzumab to catnip and capecitabine, especially when we are dealing with low intracranial tumor burden? Yeah, to me, it really determines, it's, it's about whether it's active. Um, okay. So somebody that has a history of brain mets and maybe she, you know, she had SRS and did well on TCHP, I mean, THP for a year or so, the brain's still stable and she's progressing, I'd, I'd use trastuzumab deruxtecan there. Now, if the brain's progressing and that's really the spot that you're worried about, I'm more likely to use the capecitabine with trastuzumab and tucatinib there, just because we've got great randomized data there in that specific population of patients that had progressing brain disease that showed a survival benefit. Dr. Hamilton, we also have data for TDXD, though a smaller number with good intracranial activity as well, correct? Yes, we absolutely do. But, you know, that just wasn't as large of a trial, particularly in that setting. I think that there's no doubt that we feel much more confident using trastuzumab deruxtecan in brain metastases than we did a year ago. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hamilton, for taking the time to go over the HER2 positive management for our community oncologists, especially when the field is getting more challenging by the minute. Thank you again. Thanks for letting me join you.